I try to create sympathy for my characters, then turn the monsters loose. Stephen King. You're listening to Writing Roots, brought to you by Aspen House Publishing. Welcome to Writing Roots. I'm Lee Hole. And I'm Lee Esses. Our episode today is going to continue to talk about our characters, specifically Lee's characters, in her book released last month. So beware, spoilers. We had a very long episode last time of me diving deep into your characters and going, hey, maybe this character should make this decision. I really feel like this would be more in character. Make sure we see this character's point of view. I tore you apart. Now it's my turn. Bring it on. So this is less about character voice and more about character establishment. Like the quote at the beginning said, create sympathy for the characters. You struggled a little bit with this because of how you started the book. You were like, I want to get to the action, but I actually kind of have to explain a couple of things first, and I just really want to get to the action, so I'm just going to breeze over this and just get to the action. Didn't you tell me that I needed to have less explanation for the characters in the beginning? Yes. But I do still stand by the point of there's still a lack of connection with Alana to start with. Even though you do establish her as somewhat unique right away and she's kind of following along, when she's following him, I don't get a sense that I'm going to like this girl. It's a, well, she's tagging along with an old teacher for some reason. Did I take out the part where she's commanding the troops in the library? There's a very brief mention. I've redone this opening sequence so many times. I don't remember what's in there anymore. I'm asking because that was my attempt to make her special and interesting and I'm going to like her. It's her first day and she's already commanding the troops. So that doesn't happen until four pages in at least, which she spends all of this time following MC first, which is like a couple of pages before they finally get to the library. I don't get a sense of that until they're already captured and she's broken free to go to his tent. I get what you're saying. I'm not sure how to solve it. Yeah, I don't either. This is one of those things I think I mentioned more for your future writing, because there's no real way to fix this without rewriting the whole thing again, which is just not a good idea. Sometimes you can rewrite way too much. And I feel like especially the first book in this series, that's happened a lot. That's what has led to the majority of the things that I've found, where it's been rewritten, things have gotten a little bit jumbled, you don't remember what you had, so you're having to restate, or you glance over it because you already thought it was in there. The other character that I wanted to talk about was your main character. And hats off to you for creating a character that is never once named. Thank you. The one thing about him, though, is... Yes, I know he's a seasoned warrior, but he has a surprising lack of reactions when action happens. An arrow flies over his shoulder, which if it's flying over his shoulder, there's all sorts of things in that general proximity that it could hit that would result in death. And he has zero reaction to it. He's just like, oh, hey, look, arrow flew over my shoulder. That's cool. Whatever. Like, it's probably something he's used to, but he needs to have some kind of reaction to it, not just a, yeah, okay. See, the interesting thing is in actual combat, you don't have a reaction until it's safe to have a reaction, emotionally speaking. If a punch almost hits you, you're good. It can miss by an inch, miss by a mile. It doesn't matter because you can then counter and punch back and do whatever you need to do to take them out. I suppose I could make the near miss a little more real to the readers, but I don't know if I want the MC to emotionally react in that moment. The problem with this specifically, I get not wanting to have reactions, but she had already admitted she's not a good shot. And all of a sudden, this arrow is flying over his shoulder, and he knows it's from her. I feel like even if there's no emotional reaction in that moment, there needs to be a moment of recognition that he just got really lucky. 
or she's lying about her own abilities. Because that's kind of what I thought, was she was lying about her skills. No, uh, she's invested her skills elsewhere, as you learn in a couple of scenes. So yeah, she just got (laughs) really rather quite lucky in that particular shot. And he got lucky in her shot, I guess. It's a really good thing that he doesn't have these emotional reactions in the middle of a fight, but that's not consistent. He consistently has very angry reactions in the middle of a fight. Not when he's threatened. When she's threatened, that tends to be the trigger most of the time. When someone under his protection gets threatened, and that's mostly because that's the main way to get me really angry, is you threaten someone under my protection. So just one thing to kind of keep an eye out for. Up to you, but that needs to be a choice. And again, with this particular scene, it stuck out because knowing she's bad, anyone would kind of have that, did she really just try to shoot me in the back of the head moment? (laughs) And going back a little bit to the conversation about Alana and establishing her as a likable character. This is a consistent pattern for you. You don't spend time on character interaction unless it leads to a fight. So I'm going to do what I did to you in Friday and Monday. When you establish a character interaction, you need to pay it off. You chewed me out for setup and payoff. It's my turn now. In one particular instance, you have MC out boar hunting and he makes a mental comment of, I couldn't take too long, otherwise Rocked was going to be angry. And you get back and you do like a single passing line of, yeah, he just told me to take care of it and go to bed. I was prepping for a fight. Like, I wanted something more. With that comment, it made me prepare for like, okay, this is what's going to happen. And then you just breezed over it. And then the next scene, you spend four paragraphs establishing how they make tea. (laughs) Tea is important. But yes, I get your point. What would the conversation look like? You need to have one dialogue. Because right now there is no dialogue. It's just the MC going, yeah, he was just fine with it. And we moved on. (laughs) So establish, okay, what was the initial reaction? And then have Rocked go, it couldn't have been that hard to find a boar. And MC go, well, it was a ways down the creek and I had to hike it all the way back here with this bum arm of mine. But I got a whole bore and have rocked go, <sighs> okay. I'm almost thinking he arrives back with the boar on his back and the classic Kytham passes him 20 bucks and then walks away. Because <laughs> we just had this interaction between rocked and Kytham where Rocked is sort of saying, we can trust him. And Kytham's going, well, it's your fault if something goes awry. And if that works for his character, that would be a great moment there. That he's returning, expecting possibly a fight, expecting to be angry, but really Rocked is just like, sweet, I won. Like, I knew you'd come back. That might be it. Because despite MC's opinions of Rocked, Rocked actually likes MC fairly early on. He just isn't convinced of it until later because Rocked needs to maintain this aura of owner slave in order to maintain his standing in the clan. And that moment would do a lot in proving that. So I think that would be a good thing here. Also, I know you're an action author. I've said this a couple of times so far in this series. I know you want to get to the point, but this is a fantasy novel and you have plenty of words left that you could use. Each of these came in under, what, 70,000 words? I think the first one was about 72. That was less than that. When I looked at it, it was like 66. Really? Yeah. It was was short. Maybe the last one was 72. I don't know. I'd stop paying attention after my first draft. (laughs) Don't be afraid to spend time on characters. Don't be afraid to spend time on scenes because fantasy readers like these things. We like the worlds. We like the magics. We like the characters. That's why we read fantasy. That's why we don't read action because we want to care about 
the setting and the characters. So much of your book is almost set on a black stage where there's so few descriptions about what's actually going on in the world around them. But I will be talking about that more in two episodes. It ties in with the characters. Take time to write about them. You don't have to just rush to the next fight. So what you're saying is I shouldn't write selfishly. (laughs) No, I'm saying write selfishly if that's how you want to write. But if you're going to write fantasy... Write fantasy. (laughs) Know that you can spend more time on that if you want to. I encourage it because that's what your readers are going to be looking for in a fantasy setting. Maybe do that in editing. As you've stated multiple times, I'm not a fantasy author. There is nothing about my writing that is fantasy-esque. I like creating worlds. I like creating interesting characters, interesting cultures. And this was my first foray into a magic system, which just sounded like it was fun to write. So even though I'm an action author, I still wrote selfishly. If you have a question or comment for our hosts or a topic you'd like us to cover, send us an email at writingroots at aspenhousepublishing.com or find us on Facebook by searching for Aspen House Publishing. 